Hi, welcome back to Not So Obvious Watches. If you're a subscriber, especially if you've hit that little bell icon, you'll know that every couple of days I run a poll where I ask you guys questions about what do you think on certain topics. Every couple of months, I like to come through, sweep up the more interesting ones, and then present the answers back to you. That's what we're going to do today. What I want to talk about today is the different kinds of fun people have in this hobby. I also want to talk about how many watches we have. And then I'm going to follow that up with a quick discussion about do we feel that getting on the hype train, that having elevated values, becoming an investment piece elevates or diminishes our watches? And then I want to wrap it up with your thoughts on Omega's special and limited editions. And I'm going to add to that a little bit of commentary about how shocking Omega is at communicating what's going on with its catalog. Let's get into it. Okay, so a couple of months ago, I think it was now, I did a video asking what kinds of fun you guys get out of this hobby. Um, I took the idea of the types of fun from the gaming community. They have, they tend to divide fun up into these four broad areas. So you've got people fun, which is where the point of the game is to bring people together to just enjoy what they're doing. A lot of Wii games, for example, might fall into that category. You've got hard fun. That's like your real-time strategy games where it's all about setting a goal and setting a strategy to overcome obstacles. Then you've got your easy fun. This is all about fantasy and creativity, just not even necessarily about winning, just having a great time. Think of that like Minecraft. And then finally, you've got the serious fun where perhaps there's a lot of work and repetition and grinding it out, but the game actually results in some sort of real-world gain. You might learn a language or, God forbid, actually make money. I had a feeling that those would translate quite well over into the watch hobby. And it turns out, I think they did. So I asked you, where do you think you fell? And what you found was this. First off, by far, the biggest group were the easy fun guys, the ones who just, you know, they're just here for a good time, not a long time. <laughs> they just want to try watches, move, you know, enjoy it, move it on. They don't overthink the hobby. They don't think about necessarily achieving some aim or, you know, coming up with some winning strategy. Unsurprisingly, that's 45% of you. And if you look at the community and how you sort of talk in comments, the videos and the YouTubers that get the most likes. I'm uns utterly unsurprised that the easy fun guys are by far and away the biggest group. The next group along are the serious fun guys. These are the ones who, for them, there's an element of work, an enjoyable work, a work they want to do, but work nonetheless. Um, the, I can see this is your Rolex community where there's this small group of watches that we really, really focus on and it's all about how do you get one? How do you schmooze the AD? How do you get up the pecking order? How do you find this guy? How, you, all, of that, all of that investment bro stuff is all in the serious fun side. I find it really interesting and not surprising that 26% of people put themselves in the serious fun in sort of space. And the market share for Rolex is around about 28%. I think there's more than just a casual correlation in that number. The next biggest group is the people like me, the hard fun guys, the ones who go off and read Swatch Group financial reports because well, of course you do. Or the ones who sit down and make up our own spreadsheets comparing the changes in market share from the Morgan Stanley results. Um, I'm actually a little surprised that came in as high as it did at 23%. Um, maybe it's a thing about that kind of person isn't really that social. So maybe there's more people out there like me than I thought. They just don't comment very much. Coming in last is the people fun side. I'm not surprised by that at all. Only 6% of people say that their number one source of joy for this hobby 
isn't the watches or anything around the industry, but it's just in the relationships they form. I'm, I know these people exist, and 6% of you self-reported that that's you, but I'm also not surprised that it's a relatively small number. If you think about the demographic, mostly male, mostly you know, mid-20s and up, mostly you know, reasonably well off financially, that's what it takes to be involved in this hobby, I'm unsurprised that it's not an overwhelmingly social group and that the number of people that get their entire enjoyment out of that is pretty low. So what do you think? Does that feel about right to you? Um, If not, how would you have expected it to come out? Where do you think you would fit? Let me know in the comments below. My next question was much more recent, but it, um, it really fits to do it now, is the idea of how many watches do people have in their like core collection? I don't mean total numbers. I don't mean, like if you've got 50 cheapies that you've picked up along the way, don't count them. If you've got that one grail that sits out way more expensive than everything else, I don't really want to count that. I more was interested how many people how many watches people have in their kind of core comfort zone. What inspired this question was I I was driving along and I remembered a comment I heard uh, from a a watch CEO a couple of years ago who made the remark that their research indicated that if a person bought one $5,000 watch, they probably owned seven or more $5,000 watches. At the time, I was a bit surprised, but as I've got more into this hobby, that actually begins to ring true. And I wanted to get a sense of, did it reflect your experience? What watches do you have? So I put the question out and here are the results. And as it turns out, only 3% of you are truly one and done in that hobby, in that zone. Only 23% of you have two to three watches in that collection. A whopping 56%, a solid majority, has between 4 and 10. Another 13% has between 11 and 20. And 5% of you go for 21 watches or more. Aggregating that a little bit more, that means only 26% of you have three or less watches. And 74%, near as damn it, uh, what's that? Uh, Three out of every four of you has four or more watches with a fair chunk most likely being 10 or more um that's really interesting to me and i think one of the things that really makes me wonder is is this kind of uh what's the word zero-sum game of watch comparisons that we do maybe misplaced we tend to think oh i'm going to buy this watch or this watch and i find myself thinking maybe the number is, maybe the question is, I'm going to buy this watch and then this watch. What would the order be? Or maybe I buy this watch new and this watch used. Go back to the idea of 56% of you are kind of, or 53% of you, if I remember the right thing, are in this kind of easy, fun, watches come, watches go. Maybe it's not necessarily a case of you pick one or the other, but maybe you have one for just a bit longer than the other. Um, yeah, I think this idea, uh, this idea that people have like many watches, not just two or three, but routinely have somewhere between four and 20 something, really makes me question the value of trying to compare watches as though it's a battle to the death, winner take all, only one will be bought. Okay, so my next question was a pretty simple one, which was, when a watch gets on the hype train and starts becoming an issue around availability or the ability to flip or whatever, does that elevate the watch or diminish the watch in your eyes? 27% of you said that it elevated the watch in your eyes. 48% of you said you did not care. And 25% of you said it actually diminishes the watch and makes it less exciting, less important to you. I can't help but compare sort of combine and and correlate some of the answers that we've got here the number that says the number that said that a watch becoming hyped and resale and the the ability to flip becoming a big thing was 27 percent 
when Rolex market share is 28% and those number of people that enjoy serious fun is 26%, I cannot help but think that those numbers correlate somehow. That the number of people who are really enjoy that serious fun, that they align with the number of people that really like to like get involved in buying Rolex, and they're the kind of also the kind of people that like get on the hype train and think that a watch that's in that game space is better and more important. Like I said, I find those numbers too compelling to ignore. Less compelling but still interesting is the number of people that said that they enjoy hard fun at about 23%, which is kind of knowing the things that no one else knows, that that kind of lines up with the number of people who says that if a watch gets on that train and everyone knows about it, it's kind of of less interest to me, is 25%. Again, I, I just find that correlation just a little bit too strong to ignore. What do you guys think? Am I making a mountain out of a molehill? Or do you think that there's something in the way those numbers are all kind of lining up and that we can see sort of how people derive fun, how they think about watches and what watches they choose all seem to sort of interlink somehow. Okay, so getting to my last question, uh, in one way is my simplest question, but the one that's got the most interesting long-term answer. And it was a very simple question. Do you, in 2022, think that Omega has too many limited editions? 45% of you said, yes, they do. 55% of you said, no, they don't. What's really interesting is for the 45% of you that said, yes, they have too many limited editions, apparently none is too many. Because you see, Omega hasn't really released a limited edition in almost two years. So I'm used to the idea that people often have and express their opinions on the internet not doing any research, just on what they believe to be true. It saddens me that that's as it is, but I know that's the case. So I was unsurprised that so many people quite factually got that wrong. You know, that's not even a matter of opinion. Um, None cannot be too many. So... Like I said, I was unsurprised by that. I was somewhat surprised at how big that number was, at how many people, almost half the people out there. And if you're on my channel, by definition, you're paying some attention to what's going on. You know, like half my watches, almost half my watches, felt that Omega was continuing to put out limited editions when they weren't. Now, as I said, I, I that's... If you're in that camp, you know, you guys can all think about what it is that led you to do that, why you found, why you thought that, and that's for you guys to sort out. One thing I would say, though, is it does also highlight that Omega is shocking, absolutely shocking at communicating what the hell they're doing. And what I want to do now is just walk through some of the things in their own catalog, on their own website, that are misleading people. And and it's like they're actively trying to sabotage their, their standing in the community. First off, let's just go to the number one, uh, open up the website and see, ask Omega, how many watches have you got? And right now, they're telling me that they have 1,509 different SKUs to choose from, to which all I can say is WTF. That number is ridiculous. That should be way, way less. And now let's start looking at what's going on, and in particular, what's wrong with this limited edition thing. So what I did was I started going through the catalog, looking for these limited editions that people are obviously recalling. And the funny thing is, these limited editions that were released years ago are still there. These James Bond ones that were released in 2020 are still in catalogue. Not one single one of them is available. You can't buy a single one from a shop, but they're still there. But it gets a thousand times worse. These ones that go back to, God forbid, the 2016 Olympics are still 
showing up on the Omega website. I, what is going on? Do they not want to sell watches? Are they deliberately trying to sabotage themselves? By the way, if you can find one of these 2016, um, uh, if you can get someone to sell you one of those, it's probably a bit of a bargain at like six and a half odd thousand Australian dollars. Um, this, is a, this clearly hasn't been updated in six years. But there's more to it than just the limited editions. If you go across to the Speedmaster Mark II, for example, I am 99% sure that that reference is dead. It's been out of stock, inquire about this for over a year. And if you look at the price, it just doesn't line up with what you would expect of a modern Speedmaster. I am, as I said, 99% sure that reference is gone and never coming back. And yet it continues to be here, clogging up the catalog, making people think that Omega is offering more SKUs than they really are. And the last weird thing that almost only Omega does, I can't see anyone else that does it, is they show you the same watch four times, often with just, well, in this case, routinely, with nothing different other than a, um, a, a strap change. In f just, just polluting the visual space that is their website, really confusing us over how many SKUs that they offer, how many watches they actually offer, and just what's going on with their catalog. Now, I'm going to compare them now to Breitling. And if you don't like what Breitling does as a watchmaker, that's fine. If you don't like what they're doing with watches, that's fine. I'm not comparing them as watchmakers. Purely in terms of the clarity of their communication, and in particular what's going on with the website. Now, this is the front page of the Breitling website right now. One thing that's really important to note is that the Super Ocean, the Super Ocean collection was totally revised five days ago. Within five days, the new front cover of the, uh, the website, clearly front and center is the new model. And the old model cannot be found. Go into the Super Ocean collection and all you can see is the new model. The old model is gone. You want it, you go into an AD, you maybe try and find it through some other source. But the official website will not confuse you about what is in catalog and what is not. What's even more important is notice how each version of the watch is only represented once. If you want the blue 46 millimeter, you see the blue 46 millimeter once. Open that and you'll get options about what strap you want, etc. But as far as just looking at the catalog, each watch is only shown once. This is, you know, as I said, forget whether you like Breitling or not. That's not the issue here. This is just that, that website is a masterclass of clarity and consistency and conciseness in representing your product and what you're trying to sell to someone. That's a, that's a website of someone who's really focused on being very clear in their comms. And it stands in stark contrast to what Omega does with its morass of moribund references which are dead for five and six years but still clogging up their interface. I did a video a couple of weeks ago on, you know, if I was the CEO for a, a year, what were the changes I would make if I was at Omega? You know what, if I was the CEO of Omega for one day and I could do one thing, well, now it is coming up on 8.30 at night on a Sunday night, I'd be calling my product managers now and saying that website will be fixed by first thing tomorrow morning or you're fired. It is appalling what Omega has done to themselves there. And I, I really struggle to imagine how a multi billion dollar company does it. But yeah, they have cocked that up royally. And so whilst, you know, on one hand, it's a little bit sad that 46% of people think that a company that hasn't put out a limited edition in two years has too many, the way Omega communicates is, can you blame them? 
<laughs> that's just terrible. So anyway, that's it. That's my, that's really, they were my questions to you and also a bit of my actual rant in the end um, on some of the implications of those. What do you think? What are your thoughts? Put them in the comments below. I've been Pete McConville. This has been Not So Obvious Watches. If you do want to take part in those sorts of uh, polls in the future, I would love everyone to like uh, this video, subscribe to the channel, hit the little notifications thing, and I think that'll get you through. See you later. Bye.